Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Riddell. I'm um, in Brisbane, Australia. Um, I'm, I'm from the University of Queensland from the Institute for Social uh, Science Research, and I'm really excited about being part of uh, today's session. And um, uh, as we um, deal with the challenges of being in various countries and being in person at Oxford, but also being online in our various locations. So I think it's a, a great session and really really excited about um, the, the, um, the session today. And also I think the, uh, the lead up that we've been involved with, um, with um, particularly with Felix and um, Francesca and Lee in helping us um, get to today. It's been really great with the, the panelists. And I think you'll have a, a great session with our various panelists looking at the integration of the user voice and outcomes-based contracts and beyond. And I think how we um, bring together um, user in engagement and um, co-design with, with how we deliver outcomes is becoming increasingly important in, in our process going forward. So just to um, explain today, as people no doubt will understand, we'll be um, 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 live streaming this on screen uh, there are some in-person attendees. I think Mila and Steve are presenting um, at Oxford, but most of the other, other presenters are online in their various like, locations. Um, people that are in, in the room in Oxford can join online using the join button for the session on the conference website or using the Zoom dial-in um, in the link in, um, provided for in the email invitation. I should just mention we've got, um, as I say, Francesca, who's been really, you know, um, the, the, the lead organising all this. Um, Lee is the on-room um, captain and Felix is the in-person uh, captain who will help um, um, keep people going. And as, um, as Francesca has just mentioned, please use the chat um, as we go forward, which I think will be, as we're all, I think, being used to, um, in our, as I say, in our various iterations of work um, using that going forward. So uh, just some admin, please display your name on your Zoom window if possible. Uh, keep your microphone muted, um, except when you want to speak. Um, you may have your video on or off. Appreciate sometimes that's the issue with internet capacity. Um, use the chat. Oh, I think that's really useful to build up a, a bank of you know ideas or issues that people want to present as well as you know specific questions um, if there's any technical issues please put those in the chat and um, um, our, our team will help facilitate that Very um, exciting, very interesting um, the sessions going forward. So just to, I suppose, the purpose of our overriding um, objective today is that, as I say, considering, you know, the frequent um, claim, you know, the focus a lot on the financial elements of, of how we do um, outcome-based contracting and social impact investing more generally, you know, increasingly, how do we think about the end user um, not only the, in terms of outcomes, but how do we engage them in the process of designing and implementing policy initiatives? And that's something I'm really interested in the work I'm doing here in Australia. And I think having um, met with the, our presenters, presenters today, that's a key issue for them. So how do we bring that together with how do we deliver better outcomes? And I think that's a really important theme that we want to present today. So just to quickly run through um, the approach we're taking today, we've got um, four great um, presentations from Hilary and Mila, uh, Victoria Tatoa, um, Jan and Steve, and I think Mila and Steve are in the room at Oxford, um, which is great. Um, 
and the process will then that they they will present for five minutes each presentation. We won't have any discussion in between presentations, and then we'll have a panel discussion curated with a series of questions, and then we'll have a chance for about twenty minutes or so for any questions from the audience or any discussion between presenters, and then we'll round out a round up and close at um, around um, about ten minutes before the end, and then finish up at 3 um, p.m. your time, which will be about midnight, my time here in Brisbane, Australia. So I'm um, very excited. So we'll, um, we'll also have Gary uh, Painter uh, joining as a discussant um, at, at the, um, as we go through the process. So that's fantastic. So um, we might then move on um, to the first presentation from Hilary and Mila. Great, thank you so much. I'm Hillary, and today our group will be discussing the incorporation of co-creation and strength-based working in social outcome contracts as a means to addressing pressing social needs in socially innovative ways. And we'll pro be providing two perspectives on this topic. First, with findings from recent academic research of which Gary and I are co among the co-authors. And then second with insights from the investor and program management side from Mila and Rob at Bridges Outcomes Partnerships. And Mila and I will get the presentation started and then Gary and Rob will be joining as a part of the panel discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so to begin with from the academic side, the primary research question that we asked was in what ways can co-creation and strength-based services facilitate early stage innovation within SIBs? And to answer this question, we analyzed four case studies of SIBs in the UK, all of which were managed by Bridges. And to construct these cases, we conducted interviews with program stakeholders, as well as reviewed documentation related to the programs. And then through a thematic coding of this evidence, as well as a cross case analysis, we generated three main sets of findings. First, that there were many elements of co-creation and strength-based strength working present in all four of the SIBs, but that the incorporation of user voice tended to be more limited to certain stages of the SIB process as opposed to integrated throughout. Second, that these practices helped facilitate early stage innovation through on the ground adaptation by frontline workers in addressing individual circumstances as well as the pilot testing of new approaches in order to address larger gaps and barriers within the service system. And then third, there were a number of elements to the SIB design, which helped enable these practices. And this included providing service providers autonomy in innovating to achieve outcomes, using rate cards in order to measure individual outcomes, and then providing longer term flexible funding to allow the SIB partners the ability to adjust the programs as they gained new insights. So now I will pass it over to Mila. Research was completed in the following four projects. So the first one is um, a program called Be the Change, which was being implemented by Mayday Trust. And it's a strength-based intervention which works with young people who are homeless and not in employment, education or training. Um, and that um, program completed um, at the time of the work that Hillary um, and the team did. Um, then GM Homes Partnership, which um, you would have actually heard about yesterday morning that um, Sarah Cook talked about during the leveling up session, but that is a program which worked with ind individuals who were sleeping rough um, across Manchester. Um, and um, it's a strength-based approach looking at how to really understand the experiences of those individuals and how to help them into stable accommodation and ultimately um, into um, jobs um, and um, meaningful life. Um, and on that program, actually, we, we do have in the audience, we have Ra Rachel, um, who is um, now managing a program again in Manchester, which is very much building on the learnings from this program and is focusing on young people. Um, so again, um, if there are any questions, she can answer them. Um, then Curriculum's Better Outcomes Partnership, which I guess Francisca and Felix know very well, um, which is a program in Curriculum's, um, or across Curriculum's, um, looking to empower and enable individuals to uh, sustain 
um, well, their home employment um, and ultimately achieve independence. And then finally, um, Thrive Northeast Lincolnshire um, and Rob, who is the director leading that, um, will join us during the discussion. And that is a social prescribing program, um, which is focusing on individuals with long term conditions um, in Grimsby and very much looking to um, provide strength based support for those individuals. Um, so in terms of what um, on the next slide, in terms of what I guess as practitioners, what we're trying to create um, or what Rachel and Rob um, uh, are trying to create uh, uh, in those programs is really a space where um, one has a flexible environment, which is truly um, fostering imaginative, innovative and person centered approaches. And the way we think about it is what are some of the things which are potentially barriers in a system led service led approach and how to really create them as person centered. And uh, some of the things that um, we focus on in that case are situations through which outcomes are defined. So how to create situations where outcomes are really defined by individuals rather than the system, how to move away from labels and diagnosis and how to really understand people as individuals um, and what individuals want and what um, uh, they would want to focus on and um, how to focus on service which is true well which is which is free to be innovative and which is free to change rather than service specification led and then how to again create a situation where tailored outcomes can be implemented um, and we're on a journey we you know th this is implemented to to a varying degree um, in different programs but that is certainly the vision that we're wanting to work towards um, and then finally because i think the chair is <laughs> francisco looking at me <laughs> scarily um, maybe i will leave this for rob to talk about but we did want to um, just share um, some of the specific examples of what this means for people um, given that we are very much focused on on that um, and what the journey is of this particular individual um, uh, and i think we have triangle um, audience here as well so <laughs> um, we can talk about how um, the triangle star is used in this case as a measurement tool which which has been really helpful in the um, in the implementation of this program so i will think we're out of time so i will stop there Hello, I'm Victoria Jones. Ooh. Okay, thanks, Victoria. Uh, Victoria Jones from um, uh, Northlake Carers Partnership. Hand over to you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as Tim says, I work for Norfolk Carers Partnership. I'm the program director. Uh, we're 12 months into the first of its kind uh, SIB or outcomes contract, specifically dedicated to unpaid, unpaid carers. So taking you back right to the beginning, this is the programme um, that was commissioned by Norfolk, Norfolk Local Authority. And in order to design the programme, we didn't just talk to carers, we talked to all the professionals who've worked alongside these carers. We talked to commissioners um, and we looked at the existing data. Um, it was a fairly traditional approach to begin with um, because asking carers what kind of service they would like with no experience of an outcomes contract and having only ever experienced existing services, it's a really big question to, to, to pose to people who, who don't work within the industry or who don't have the technical expertise. What this does do through, through steering groups, it allows us to develop at the beginning the nuts and bolts of the service, if you like, what work, what's worked well in previous services, what hasn't worked well, and what in theory would they like to see going forward. A really good starting point, having open, honest conversations to include the commissioners and, and all the data to, to tell carers and other participants what we already know and what we the ideas that we already have. Uh, alongside that, we also have the independent evaluator, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Next slide. Thank you. OK, so moving away from the traditional uh, approach, when we when we very first set up a service, what we like to do at Norfolk is look holistically at all the different voices of our carers. Now, these come in many forms. So Carer's Voice, this is our inherited service user involvement group, long standing group. And I'm going to use the phrase that, that is bandied about so often when we talk about collaborative design. I'm going to say the usual suspects. Um, we know that they can be problematic within services, but also they can't be written off because they're a wealth of knowledge and they are great advocates for the, the end beneficiaries of any service. Staff engagement. Staff are dealing with, with carers day to day to day. They also know the practicalities of, of running operations online. And when we want to ask a, a carer a question, the first people we can go to is, is the staff. 
because they're talking to them every day. Moving away from the, the, the sort of very, oh, sorry, Mike, thank you. Uh, moving away from the very binary, we'll come up with a, a, a giant question and then we'll go out to consult with people. We prefer to have conversations with people and to keep those conversations going. Alongside that, we have the independent evaluation by IPC. Now, what this does is this gives us an extra layer in, to enable us to listen to the wants and needs of, of carers with experience in our service. Um, they talk to a, an external provider and somehow can be more open and honest about what's working and what's not working from, from them. That obviously in collaboration with, with the, uh, the research that they're, they're doing. The last one for me is really, really important, data. Now, it might not sound very collaborative and, and carer friendly, but carers not only tell us what they want by the things that they say, they also tell us what they want by the way they behave. This is really exciting. Uh, a number of times throughout the, the, the programme um, delivery, we've noticed conflicting um, voices. So carers tell us they want training. We provide training. Carers don't appear. So we then, we then have to look at ourselves as organisations and, and ask what questions are we asking? Are we asking what do carers mean when they tell us they want training? So that then one, one piece of information that we get from one section of listening informs another. And we go around to all the, all the different areas, the staff, the carer's voice, uh, we send out surveys and that informs it. It gives us a much more rounded, informed approach to, to our service innovation and service delivery. Next slide. So where we are now, um, what we don't want to do is, is make service user involvement a tick box exercise. It's uh, we want to have open, ongoing conversations with our carers and continue to de deliver, continue to innovate. And we do this by having a self audit to say, what are we doing well? What are we not doing? And build, really put the foundations down for going into the future. So the first area of that is equality and understanding that while we can provide the te technical expertise and the money, um, the carers provide that context and their own uh, lived experience to, to inform this. Um, the next is diversity. So we're looking at the representation across the board, develop strategies to target underrepresented groups to see if our services is supporting them in the right way and to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, we identify barriers to participation, whether it's language or accessibility. Um, we now have improved data systems to capture and monitor the diversity of people accessing the service, but also those who are, who are sharing their thoughts and views with us. Accessibility, we, we all know about the, the, the issues with COVID and um, having face-to-face -face meetings and so on. So we widen our reach through improved channel planning, catering for those with different needs, whether it's a learning difficulty, literacy issues, um, digital exclusion as well. We, we look at co-production or co-design and co-facilitation now. We're trying to move away from the, the traditional structures when you put on only systems where people can go to meetings to have their voices heard, you only attract the sort of people that like to go to meetings. So we use social media, we use surveys, we have conversations with people. What we really want to get away from is those really traditional, quite restrictive structures of how people can have their, their voices heard. And um, removing the other barriers to participation, technology, timing, structure and format. The reciprocity one is really, really important for us. So we close the feedback loop. Traditionally in services, we go out and we ask carers what they think, uh, but we don't tell them what we've done with that information. Organisations have been no notoriously bad at feeding back. So what we, we do, we track all the consultations. What this also does is it, it prevents people from being reconsulted on the same issues time and time again. We build up a picture over time and it stops us from having people get into um, consultation fatigue. Nobody likes to be asked the same things time and time again. We have developmental workshops and we work in partnerships with the carers and staff members to, to, to build these workshops so that we, we really understand. We've got our finger on the pulse. We're not sort of planning things out 12 months in advance. We're listening to what's going on. We're listening to the word on the ground and, and we are building our service around that. We also said, this is a really key for me. We're setting clear parameters and managing expectations. Asking people, what do you want is such an open question. And then when you come back and tell them they can't have a 20-foot gold statue in the town centre, they're cross because you ask them a question without having to put those parameters in. The key to this is being really open, honest, and, and having a, an adult-to-adult -adult conversation with the service users that we're working with around realistically what, what we can expect, what they can expect for us, and, and what parameters we're, we're working within. 
this has been really, really well received. The feedback that we've had from our carers is it's so nice to have someone be honest with us, to, to talk to us um, and, and to, to tell us what the issues you're facing are in addition to, to the issues that carers are facing. Okay, thank you very much for having me. That, that's me, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, I'm Debbie Montali. I'm the technical coordinator at Care International here in Malawi. Uh, my presentation will be about um, how we have elevated user voice and integrated it into projects and programs in Malawi to improve outcomes and uh, service delivery, as well as how we have done that uh, during the pandemic as well. Um, with the in collaboration with the youth, um, the different youth networks across the country, and particularly the ones in Ncheu, Malawi, which is a district here in Malawi. So I'll start by quickly explaining what the community scorecard is. And this is, um, basically the community scorecard is a social accountability approach, approach that is uh, locally led and user driven. And this approach brings together uh, service delivery users uh, service providers um, at frontline level, as well as service providers at district level, as well as other stakeholders that are providing the particular service in whatever sector that you're looking at. So this could be community-based organizations, it could be um, political members um, at community level, as well as other structures that are available. They come together and discuss the service utilization, as well as the service provision challenges, and then they uh, more like in a structured interface, they come together and co-create an action plan to address some of those priority needs. So um, the community scorecard has been used in different kind of um, ways. It's also been used to um, create programs. So at different levels of the program, um, doing design, um, doing implementation, as well as doing evaluation, as well as also being used as evidence to um, influence national policy and also used to drive and encourage transparency and accountability um, from the government of Malawi and also to uh, bring up user uh, voice and elevate that um, so at district and national level and the real-time data that the community scorecard uh, provides. So, um, the youth in Malawi, particularly the ones in Cheo, have championed the process and implemented the community scorecard in various sectors, um, limited but not in, um, limit, uh, including but not limited to health. Um, so health as in maternal and health, um, family planning. They've also looked at um, the humanitarian space as well. So conducting the community scorecard to address um, challenges that are in those sectors. So basically after COVID hit and the restrictions that we, uh, we experienced, the youth could not go out and do community scorecard um, in person and we couldn't go out to support them as they implement the community scorecard. So once those restrictions were done, CARE Malawi decided to develop um, a USSD platform so that we can conduct remote community scorecard, building on the uh, work that the youth had been doing and the databases that the youth had had, we developed a platform that uh, service users were able to send SMSs as well as WhatsApp messages. Um, on the screen, there's a picture of uh, one of the SMSs that came in um, to report any service um, interruptions as well as the situation on the ground in relation to COVID-19 and also um, just anything that they were experiencing. So this feedback was then synthesized and we um, created some um, indicators that they were able to also score and rate so that we can know just how bad or just how well the situation was going. And then after that, all of this was um, put together and we organized a call-in radio that was both tested at national level. And they were able to, uh, service users were able to call in and then interact with the frontline service providers as well as the district service providers other people at national level and um, other users uh, nationally were able to call in and also weigh in on the issues that were being discussed. So a lot of the, um, the things that they were experiencing were clarified, you know, the myths and misconceptions surrounding COVID-19, service interruption and things like that. Next slide, please. So following the remote community scorecard, um, some of the results were that over uh, 600 health workers were able to influence the high level decisions um, because of the, um, 
the community feedback and support from the national coalitions, their feedback was elevated and it was able to impact the budget. Um, the family planning budget was planned to be decreased, but then with the feedback that they had gotten from the community scorecard that was done remotely and led by the youth, the budget was increased um, because the money was supposed to be reallocated to some of the COVID-19 response activities. And also the, it allowed for real time sharing of data like from the, from the ground, despite the fact that we couldn't go to the communities and engage with the community, the remote community scorecard allowed for that. And also, it also allowed for a relaunch of the PPE distribution to also accommodate the community-based distribution agents, which uh, were mostly youth that weren't um, previously accounted for when the, the launch of the PPE distribution was done. And also, it also helped um, different people um, connect to their local government to express their concerns as well. Uh, next slide, please. So now this... Uh, uh, technology is being used um, currently to address the COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Um, so there's been a lot of myths and misconceptions around the vaccines and the different kinds that are coming into Malawi. And there's been rumors in this age where social media is available to so many people. So it's giving the chance to the government as well to address some of those on top of some of the systems of communication that they already have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tapia. We'll, we'll move. We'll move straight on to um, Jan Warner and Steve Hindle from the um, Elton John AIDS Foundation. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, Steve and I will talk today. Just give a brief overview of the Zero HIV Social Impact Fund. If you want to move me to the next slide? I can start by telling you about the background work that built the Social Impact Fund. And it's, it's really interesting because our foundation is committed to ending the HIV epidemic, but we, we had no experience before working on this specific social impact bond around innovative financing or outcome-based methods. This was um, very much a journey we went on based on the engagement that we had from um, an ethnographic study. So it, it built specifically um, we specifically built this ethnographic study to listen to the voices of undiagnosed individuals in Lambeth, Southwark, and Lewisham, where we were seeing high prevalence but uh, stagnation in, um, in reduction of HIV and just kind of, there, was a there were clear barriers that were not being addressed and we wanted to know exactly what those barriers were. As we spoke to communities, we were really understanding that there are some specific interventions that could be useful. So universal testing and targeted testing are named here at the bottom and, and they emerge through the research as really helpful interventions. But we also heard themes of personalized barriers that might need additional support. And we heard themes that, that kind of traditional mechanisms had not thought about the whole person in, in the way that um, in a way that would be really beneficial to the, to the people that were most looking for collaboration and, and who needed to be tested, needed to be brought into care. So we built the social impact bond to focus on, on individuals and then empower providers to work with individuals in the ways that were necessary. Next slide. As you can see through this theory of change slide, it kind of moves from the specific interventions, which we said, did come out through the ethnographic work, but we're not as precise, I think, when we first started the work. It's worth mentioning that we're now two and a half years into our social impact bond, and we have um, 11 providers that have all had really diverse interventions, and, and even those who are completing the exact same intervention have tailored it to populations that they've been reaching. So, recall and audit systems, for example, have been really tailored uh, just based on, on what the providers have heard from service users. And that drives to the end, the specific outcomes we've targeted around bringing people into HIV care and the longer term goals and, and shorter term goals around uh, systems change, how, how we're gonna have clinician change and then long-term goals around cost savings and commissioning. Can we go to the next slide? And, and Steve, do you wanna to speak to this piece? Thanks, Jen. 
So we think here about user voices. Like many programs, we've conducted a kind of good hygiene practice around user involvement. So we invited users at the beginning to say what the issues were. We then invited them to work with us in the co-design. So to give you one example, within two hospitals, people who now go into the emergency department, the accident and emergency department, have an HIV test if they have blood drawn for another reason. One hospital has chosen to do that based on a consent that's based around signage. And users were invited to describe the signage that they think would be appropriate, and then to kind of validate that the signage actually gave people enough opportunity to have a moment to choose whether they wanted to opt out. In other words, not to take this HIV test. The program has been successful. So at this moment in time, we are just shy of 400 people who've been linked back to care. Some of those people were undiagnosed and have been brought into care. Others were people who knew their diagnosis, but for some reason had stopped treatment. And along with this kind of start of co-creation, there's been adaptation along the way. So two examples that we have. One of the things about somebody receiving an HIV diagnosis, perhaps as a point of care, which would be something that you would then need to go to a hospital clinic and have confirmed and then get an appointment to start treatment. For some people in the community, they've received their diagnosis. But the impact of an HIV diagnosis might be such with the amount of stigma that's attached to it, that would actually stop them, almost freeze them in their tracks, and they would never reach the HIV clinic to get the necessary treatment. And working with community organisations, we sounded out the feedback about requesting money for transport or food, and perhaps asking for somebody to accompany them who they felt as a trusted companion. These were things that we hadn't really considered in the forefront because for us, from our viewpoint, having HIV would be the most important thing in their life. But for many of the people who we were talking with, it was not the most important thing in their life. And they were willing to take a risk on letting it slide for a year or two or five until they became unwell. Thinking more about the... Um, the use of voices. Did this program, particularly thinking around the emergency department, well, one of our stats is that over 75% of people with a blood test are also taking an HIV test. And there are good medical reasons why some of that other 25% will not have taken. Some people are just easier to bleed than others. And actually, it might be quite difficult to get enough blood to do the three samples that are required. Next slide, please. So if we think about going through this kind of co-creation, this adaptation, and then we think about sustainability, the use of voice has informed both policy and practice. I'll be speaking to a question about informing practice a little later. So I'm going to think, uh, informing policy a little later. So I'm going to think more about practice. And you can see from these couple of quotations that when we ask people, what did you think of this intervention? Because there was a question mark, would people prefer not to know that they had HIV? Are you actually imposing knowledge of HIV upon an individual through doing this? And so we questioned through our providers around this. And you can see here we have a couple of um, quotations. The first, the thought of HIV didn't even cross my mind once. And the second, tell them my story encouragement will save lives and unnecessary suffering. And it's this kind of user involvement, whether it be through quotes on a page or whether it's through be a person actually telling their story to other clinicians, has been really impactful in changing opinions. HIV carries a lot of stigma in our society. It carries stigma with the public, but it also carries stigma with the health service. Once you go outside of the HIV clinician bubble, then the general NHS healthcare 
staff are really not that informed. So having users come and tell their story, the fact that if the viral load is very low in the body means that it cannot be transmitted onto other people. Having that kind of story told by users is incredibly important in changing opinion. Thank you. Great, thanks, um, thanks Steve um, and Jen. I, I think uh, uh, just to quickly sum up on the, um, the four presentations we've had, I think they've sort of traversed the, the whole range of issues from service delivery policy, um, how do we engage um, diverse users, and I think a whole, whole rich set of insights there. So we've got um, um, some time for a panel discussion, and we've got a few questions that I'll, I'll put um, um, to some of the panellists to help stimulate our thinking and, and, and sort of uh, dive a little bit into what we've been talking about today um, and uh, across some, uh, our key themes for the um, um, for today's session. And the first one being, you know, how does um, a SIB design help to facilitate the integration of user voice? And I thought I'd, I might go firstly to, to Mila and Hilary um, um, is there a potential tension between having predefined outcomes on a rate card and, and striving for greater user responsiveness in, in service delivery design? If Hilary or, or, um, or Mila would like to respond to that. Thank you, Tim. So, Hilary, I can see you. <laughs> I can start and it would be great to... Um, to, to have your reflections as well. Um, but I think, well, I guess reflecting on um, what happens maybe in other arrangements, so not necessarily outcomes arrangements, I think that we see situations whereby programs in more traditional design tend to have quite clear specifications. Um, and it is quite hard to outline well, as, as we heard through all of the examples, it's hard slash impossible to outline on day one what things will look like, um, particularly over, long, uh, over a long period of time. Individuals do have very different needs. Their needs change over time. Um, and it, 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 coming up with a service specification that would account for all of that on day one is, is impossible. And most importantly, the individuals who are working with uh, with people and trying to deliver the service will learn a huge amount about what is actually working well and what's not working well. Um, and so, so I guess having, um, having, a, having a setup which allows you to have that flexibility up um, at the design stage, but, but also during delivery is, is key. Um, and, and I think from our experience, what we feel is that actually a rate card a varied rate card, a well-designed rate card, and a focus on outcomes actually does enable that versus a situation where in a more traditional procurement, you're not defining the outcomes, you're defining the whole service and you're doing that through a service specification. And I guess where we got to is that it is, there are probably, um, well, a few different ingredients. So in terms of what's still a problem with the detailed specification. So as I said, you cannot really define it at the beginning, but also, you may have a situation where your contract is not technically letting you change things because you are contracted in a way whereby you're told that you have to do things a certain way. And then the third point, which I think, well, which is related to what Steve was asking about in the earlier session, there is a point of culture. And are you, does your organization allow you to actually test things or are you funded and encouraged to only report on things that work and therefore potentially miss out on trying something brilliant, which can create great results, but may not work. Um, so, so I guess the way to, or some ways to address some of those points is to be in a situation where you do have loops, which provide you with the insight that tells you what, what is actually working well and what are people saying. And those are the examples that, or many of those are the examples that we heard today. The second is a mechanism through which you can analyze those and prioritize different um, options, if you will. And then thirdly, an actual technical design, which allows you to change things. And I guess in our experience, a focus on outcomes actually allows you to do all of that versus what would happen sometimes in more traditional contracting. So, um, so I think it, it creates a positive ecosystem rather than a tension, I suppose. 
Um, but I'd love to hear what Hillary. Um, yes. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, great points made there. Um, just on the to answer the second question or address it, um, the potential for there being some tensions between the rate card and individual outcomes or responsiveness to individual um, circumstances. In the interviews, um, some individuals did mention that there were challenges, um, for instance, in demonstrating that individuals were making progress towards the outcomes, even if they didn't necessarily meet the specific targets. Um, also, that when you're measuring the targets for the outcomes in the SIB, it doesn't necessarily always coordinate with um, measuring improvements in user <laughs> satisfaction. Sorry, I have my cat joining there for a moment. Very good. Um, <laughs> and then, there were also some tensions between measuring um, longer term outcomes, which would show, you know, longer term and sustainable well being for individuals within the shorter confines of the shorter contract times, um, which sometimes led to outcomes being measured through proxies for the purposes of the SIB outcomes. And then just generally some difficulties in allowing for definitions of individual success. Um, while still having to very clearly state which outcomes are going to be measured for the repayment within the SIB structure. And something that I thought was um, a helpful and insightful comment from one of the interviewees was that, you know, for some individuals success might look like thriving, whereas for other individuals, it might just look like surviving. So I think that can be hard to capture um, within, within outcomes, even if it is in a more of a flexible rate card. Great, great, thank you. I, I, I might ask Gary, um, a painter, um, just in terms of um, have you observed greater integration of user voice in the US context? Um, um, and if so, what do you think the reasons are for this? If not, what do you think are the barriers to greater integration of user voice? We might come back to this, this which is an overriding theme for our, our session a little bit more about sort of drilling into that a bit more. But Gary, if you're happy to make some comments. Sure, thank you, Tim, for the the question and Francesca and others for organizing this this conversation. I think the, the what's hard for some folks, especially as we're all representing different continents, is just to kind of say, what is user voice? Um, and so for us in the, in the US context, it's often thought about user voice can fit in kind of two buckets. One is stakeholder engagement and stakeholder engagement um, may have, I would say, a couple of ways that are actually nefarious ways to engage users. So you just inform users so that they know what's coming before they actually receive something. And then you may placate users in one way or another. If they don't really like what's happening, then you do something in addition. Um, I think the most common form of st stakeholder engagement that is viewed you know, appropriately, and this is actually what we see in SIBs most often, is what I would call consultation. Um, so this consultation, either in, in, either with in direct connection with users or with providers who are proxies for users, I think what we've seen in SIBs to date in the majority of cases is that um, there's so many other stakeholders involved that the time it has you know to take to design the contracts and so on and so forth with users specifically. Um, has not been taken. Instead, providers have been used as proxies for that. Um, but what we see in broader context around social investment and social innovation is a, is a real understanding that in order to have, you know, um, to develop solutions to complex social problems, you need to develop iterative and inclusive processes. Um, and whether you may call it co-creation on some continents or co-production here in the U.S., it needs to have these elements of bringing in users as that stakeholder group to, to help us understand the problem we're trying to solve. And you heard that in the conversation so far today around what are the outcomes we're trying to look at anyway, um, to involve them in co-design of potential new solutions, to involve them in piloting um, and beyond. And I think what's unique um, that people are really grappling with here in the US context is how do you bring them in on the evaluation side as much as in the design side. 
Um, and, you know, I really appreciated what, what Mila said about who comes to meetings. Um, I think that's a great point about users who may or may not always want to, you know, actually be facilitating engagement in, in our formal structures that we have often engaged other stakeholders. Um, but that evaluation piece is something that we're really working with. I think the other thing that is a shift in mindset that you're, you're seeing all across the globe is this question of where does expertise sit? And so in part, our, my, in my view anyway, our reluctance to actually use users as critical um, participants in the process from problem defining, outcome development, co-design and, and evaluation is that we haven't actually believed that the users are the experts. And so um, that shift in mindset is happening in the U.S., but to date, as it relates to social impact bonds specifically, we haven't seen as, as, as large strides as I think I would like and others would like, but we are starting to see it in other kinds of outcomes-based approaches in social investment and social innovation more broadly. Thanks, Gary. I think that that tension between um, the, 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 the co-design and co-production versus consultation, I think, is a really important point. Um, I think um, um, I find in Australia where people are now talking about co-production, co-design a lot more, whether they actually mean it. Um, and you and actually it is, it is more than just informing um, or consulting, I think, is a really critical issue. And I think we need to really, it's a big challenge, I think, to how we think about um, designing and developing and evaluating, as you mentioned, I think that's really, really critical. Um, I think we've also got Rob from Bridges. Does, Rob, do you want to make any comment? Hi there. No, it, well, I do. Uh, it's been really interesting listening uh, to different uh, perspectives. I think we have an issue where we don't trust uh, the people that uh, we, <laughs> who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of the services and listen to them. And we can get into a situation where, it, you know, patronage and expertise gets in the way of reality. Uh, and building on what that, I think the first thing is trust. You need a very strong board and governance who's going to allow you to change, understand the rate cards, but you also need to trust the voices of those that are uh, recipient of the service because actually in the end it's their service. Um, secondly, there's a, there's a massive time lag, especially in some of the projects in Northeast Lincolnshire. It could be two years after the the work's done where you start to see the, the positive outcomes in relation to managing their long-term health conditions and their own personal well-being. So you, you can't wait for that data. What you need to listen to is people, what they want to do. And the offering sometimes with providers is far too narrow. You know, we don't have a program that says, I really want to dress up as Elvis Presley, or the one thing I want to do is start uh, community gardening, or things that are completely outside of my imagination or anyone else's that actually is the important thing for each of those different lives. And I think finally, you, we, we understand that everyone is different, but at the same time, we're very social animals. And in Northeast Lincolnshire, by setting up interest groups, whether it is sewing, dancing, gardening, walking, fishing, whatever it is, brings those people together and creates collective assets. And, you know, you might want, we give it a different name, but that's the, what we're doing. They have agency, we give them their budgets, they spend the money that, where they are, and we make it a more sustainable, uh, sustainable model. So I would just say, yeah, trust people, however wacky it might sound. Mm. Great, great, Rob. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we, might, we might just keep moving, and then we're starting to get a few questions in the, the chat too, which is good, which we'll come back to at the end of the, the curated session here. Uh, the, the next sort of theme we wanted to explore was at what, which stage of the program and in which form should the user voice be integrated? And I thought I might just move to, um, to, Pia, to Pia and ask, what, what, where do you see challenges and benefits of using digital methods for increasing user voice engagement? And, and you'd talk a bit about that in your presentation and give other examples of where that worked and maybe where it didn't work. 
Um, yes. So you, I think I'll start with the benefits because in the case of like now the pandemic, you can't do, uh, well, in Malawi at the beginning, you couldn't do face-to-face uh, -face interviews. You couldn't engage in like uh, focus group discussions. You couldn't bring people together. So I find or user engagement has been uh, an asset in this manner because then you could do it digitally. Um, and in Malawi, because a lot of the population don't even have uh, smartphones, we had to use the most basic phone. So wherever they had mobile network, that was one of the things that uh, as long as you had mobile network, you could send this SMS to a toll free line and everything you were going through was was recorded. So um, I think another benefit of like using digital engagement uh, to engage digital platforms to engage users is because of um, it allows you to also discuss sensitive issues without having to 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 bring people together into a group so the the idea of things like confidentiality is a little bit more um, taken care of than in a more open setting or in a face-to-face -face setting. So I think another thing is that um, users are able to participate in their comfort of their homes anywhere at any time which can also be a challenge as well because because of um, that comfort and the the um, opportunity to participate anywhere at any time other people feel like they shouldn't participate. So you have um, a more uh, a lower response rate when you use digital platforms to engage users. So I think another thing that I would say is that um, it also allows you to escalate issues and also um, tie in whatever you collect from your users or whatever comes out of your um, questions or your surveys or whatever you're using to engage users um, to connect to other digital platforms. So like in Malawi, we're able to um, connect our digital platform to the, to the health management information system that the government has set up. So we have um, qualitative answers to some of the quantitative indicators that they may have um, in when they're tracking the different services and the different interventions that are, are being led by the government as well. So I think another thing is it also helps us manage the data and things like that. But I think the challenges come in where technology is introduced, where other people do not know how to use the technology. Um, it's not available to them. It's not accessible to them. It's not convenient for them as well. Um, as well as um, if sometimes it needs special support, sometimes it's expensive. So those are some of the challenges that we've had. But um, mostly we also did develop, uh, develop a system to track the COVID symptoms. Um, when COVID hit, Malawi did not have that kind of system to, um, to track the symptoms and basically like a link between the different cases like case management. So we did have an SMS-based platform that allowed people to, um, to send out whatever symptoms they were facing and get linked to different uh, frontline service providers in the health sector, um, basically manage the COVID-19 potential cases and confirmed cases as well. So that's some of the work that we've been doing. Um, it's been tricky though. Um, every time everything is a little bit more complicated, we do have some challenges in how users interact with the platforms. So that's some of the challenges that we have faced in the digital work we've done. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. I might ask Jen Warner, um, in terms of what challenges do you see in increasing the voice of vulnerable user users, service users, and how can we overcome those in SIB design um, and implementation? Yeah, thank you. I think that's such an important question. And I think some of the previous answers have even started to touch on this question, but it's so big. Um, there are a number of barriers specific to, to I'd start with accessing individuals. Um, I think this is mentioned previously with kind of who comes to meetings, but I think there's a lot of complexity and unpack on why someone might or might not attend um, and why in a meeting might or not, might not feel suited, how they might or might not have even heard about the meeting. So many people that we would categorize, I think, as vulnerable populations um, have also historically been categorized as hard to reach populations. And I've heard a lot of uh, resistance to this language and have some resistance myself because I think there's the hard to reach really speaks from a, the position of authority, which has historically not been taking their perspectives into account. 
um, it's hard to reach and that we don't know what they're saying. Um, and, and we, uh, we don't know how to find out, um, but they're not hard to reach from themselves um, internally. They don't feel hard to reach. Um, I, we have a service provider on our social impact bond who's uh, a Latin American man and, and provides services to Latin Americans specifically. And he's always called, um, he's always called popularly, what we might categorize as vulnerable populations or hard to reach as hidden people, which I, I find, I've found that language funny as well because he spends all of his time with these hidden people. They're not hard for him to find. Um, it's really that they're hidden from the system itself when you talk to him about what, what he means. Um, he feels like a, a huge amount is when you go into the community, it's very easy to find. But um, when you look from the positions of who's measuring, who's understanding, who's involved in the room, those, those voices are hidden. So I think the first fix to consider is reach, reach people where they are, um, really consider whose voices are left out and then find people who can go, go access those voices either through an ethnographic study, people with expertise to, to access that. That's one way we did it towards the beginning or through engaging community members, um, which is a huge, huge asset that we have on our social impact bond where people are able to um, kind of come from that much more community perspective. It's inviting them in as in a way that feels accessible is a really important part of that. You can't invite someone to a meeting and say, you're going to do this my way. You have to, um, whether you're thinking about incorporating their voice into the project or whether you're thinking about bringing them services, you have to really consider um, what, what their needs are, what their desires are, and what, what would feel right for them. And, and that will make them more able to engage or more willing to engage. And a final kind of fix I would tack on to these pieces, which it pretty naturally translates, is consider their time valuable. Um, and when relevant, compensate for time. I think this brings up another piece of the puzzle, which is resourcing and time, which has already been brought up. I mean, time is a very valuable resource alone, um, whether you're compensating it or not, um, especially when you're setting up a social impact bond and these things drag out for a long time. So aligning stakeholders on this being a really important piece of the puzzle and something that you're willing to spend time on is, is an important piece of work around stakeholder engagement. The final piece that I, I mentioned on this point, and, and I think that there's plenty to continue going into, but um, I, I raised bias specifically because it, it came up a bit in the chat and I think it's worth, worth thinking about. There's a huge bias towards kind of representation bias that could be very dangerous when you're thinking about user voices. Um, you can think about this partially if you're only talking to providers and they're representing service users in a certain way. You can think about it in a different way if service providers kind of um, have become one group in your mind and the, and the architects of the social impact model or stakeholder leaders are not willing to get deep enough into the community to unpack difference and, and really bring in multiple individuals. Um, and then there's also unconscious bias, which I think was brought up in, in the chat. And I think that's something that's going to be challenging in any setting, especially if you're bringing individuals in to inform something that feels outside of their normal wheelhouse and might be in settings they're not normally comfortable with. But the only and the only thing that I think you can raise there is really treating the service user as the expert in, in any way you can and, and really trying to tailor the environment to feel like you're actually welcoming them in. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. We'll, we'll keep moving. I'm not conscious there's a few questions in the chat we want to get to, too, after the curated session. Um, Victoria, I thought I might just raise with you about how do you think user voice can be better integrated with, with other approaches, particularly data gathering, which you talked about in your presentation? Absolutely. So I think when we traditionally talk about the user voice, it, it has been going out to ask people questions and, and answers rather than looking at everything as a whole. Um, so we've never really got to grips with, with looking at the, the bigger picture. 
I said quite often we get conflicting information and I think I gave the example of the the training but also another issue we faced was when we set up the service and we we, um, were in discussions with carers around an advice line that we run um, the the feeling was we run it as a seven seven day a week service. From a business point of view it didn't seem to make um, too much sense we weren't sure to try and spread resource out over the week um and then we brought the data in we looked at the data so without making any assumptions we'll see we'll see what's actually going on and when we presented that nobody was actually calling this advice line um on a sunday we took that back to carers and we talked to them why do you think people don't want to do it and and the overwhelm they overwhelmingly supported the decision to um just to close that and, and move the resource to to midweek where it was most needed um i think using as many methods as possible. There's a place for, for everybody in um, carer's voice or, or service user involvement in general. It's creating those links between those, those voices. Um, we have another option where we actually just take on ad hoc feedback and we, we track that. Um, and once we get that, then we go and dive into the data to see if the data is telling us the same thing. We then go back and look at other methods, whether it is either conversations through staff members directly with carers or whether it's we feel we, we need to do um, an, an actual consultation piece around that. So it's constantly keeping your eyes and ears open for every opportunity to engage and to include the end users, whether it's through direct conversations, whether it's through surveys or whether it's through uh, the, the way they behave. Um, and the data has proved absolutely invaluable uh, as, as one of the sort of collaboration tools that we've used. We're better informed, um, but actually the carers that we're talking to, we're better, better able to inform, inform them about how the service is developing, what we see as upcoming trends. And then we have a pool of, of lived experience experts then that tell us why they think these things are happening and the, the best way to, to address them. I think it's really important that when we look at service user involvement, uh, we see this is not a, a static um, a static piece of work. So as I mentioned in my presentation, at the very beginning, it is very much the nuts and bolts of a service. People don't expect more. They don't understand that they can expect a better service, that they should be asking for better service. And as this relationship grows and develops and they look at the innovation, what we're finding now is people are coming up with their own ideas. They're, there's far more free flowing conversations because from days gone by when they just, this is what the service is and you know, are you hitting numbers? We're now saying, so what would you like to see? What exciting projects? And some of our most exciting um, pilots that we've got going have come directly from somebody in a meeting making an off off the cuff remark around, um, wouldn't this be a really, really great idea? And um, it's it's having the facility and the structures in place to to, to capture um, all the different parts of the conversation and and use data to to see whether they that, that backs it up. Right, thank, thanks, Victoria. And, and Steve, I thought I might ask you, how do you, um, how can we ensure that the user voice affects national or local policy design? Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> I think we've come a long way in the last 25 years since nothing about us without us became a catchphrase for disability rights organisations. But there's still, I think, a tendency for both local and national policy to view itself as saying we've identified a need, we've identified an intervention, we understand the cost, and we understand the outcomes. There is a logic to approaching that, but often it does not understand the lived experience of those people for whom the intervention is seeking to provide a service. When I think about with our, within our own SIP, we intentionally set about developing evidence about interventions and about costs and about the lived experience. So that at this point, as our SIP closes in a few months' time, we then have the arguments that will lay out both the logical side and the emotional side. To some extent, all outcome-based contracts are working with vulnerable people. Some of these people have more stigma attached to the groups in which they belong. 
We might think of HIV, we might think of homelessness, we might think about addiction. And we sometimes do not recognize within our logical commissioning and policy processes that there are human elements, emotional elements about, do these people really deserve? Are they worthy? And this impacts people's decision-making. They might not admit it, they might not have it front of mind, but there is certainly something there. And the best way to break down this kind of stigma and prejudice is about people coming along and telling their stories, saying what life was like, saying what the intervention meant for them, saying what they think their life will be in the future, and then making that ask around saying, these interventions are positive for people like me, we should fund them. So to give you an example that is happening in this next couple of weeks, we worked as, well, alongside two other organizations, the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust to create an HIV commission, which was an independent body. It took evidence from up and down the country, from user groups, from individuals, from professional associations, policymakers, commissioners, it then developed 20 recommendations. We put those out for publication last 1st of December, which is World AIDS Day. Matt Hancock, the current Secretary of State at that point, made a commitment to an HIV action plan. And we are now in that crunchy, crunchy few weeks before the spending review at the end of October, which will then determine the government funding for the HIV action plan to be announced in December. And we're working in partnership with UK CAB, which is a national uh, alliance of people living with HIV, who will undertake a letter writing exercise to ministers. And in each one of those letters will be something about how the interventions have affected them, what difference it makes to their life, what would have helped them if they did not have help at that point, and how these things work. Letter writing is a policy influencing tool. And to be truthful, I don't know how many of those are going to end up on the minister's desk. But the people around him or her are likely to read at least some of these and get that sense. And whether we do it on a national basis to a minister, or whether we do it on a local basis to local commissioners, to assistant directors, to place-based directors, giving them the opportunity to understand life from another person's lived experience and then give them the experience of how that life changed through a particular set of circumstances, I believe gives us the best chance to influence local or national policy. Great, Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, that's been a great session, I think, of this um, digging into, into the presentations and some of the themes that came out. And I think um, each of the presenters and, the, and, the, and I think the questions tried to, to, to sort of um, uh, drill into that a little bit. We've got some time and we're a little bit over time in terms of our program today, but I noticed in the chat there's been some great great questions um, raised and some of it answered by, by people in the chat. We've got, I, I suppose, 15, maybe 15 minutes just for any um, additional questions from people. If not, I'll, um, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the room, we might just pause for a moment if there's any questions in the room. If not, yeah, we'll go to... Yeah. Sorry. No? No, okay. Um, I might just quickly try and look at the, um, the chat. I've just noticed one question, I think, from Ian. Um, what approach do you use to get input and to perform impact measurement among, among low language target groups? I think that went to a bit of the, the point about vulnerable groups um, in, in terms of how we, um, you know, how we target um, more disadvantaged groups in, um, and, and as I think all the panellists have said, um, end users are not a homo homogeneous group. We've got to think about different groups. So I think that's a, a really important question that we might, I don't know if there's any quick comments from people that have worked with, you know, more disadvantaged, you know, dif different groups at different, um, di different levels of disadvantage. Anyone want to 
comment on that? Sorry, Tim, could you just repeat the, the very first part of the question? I didn't think I... Uh, the, the point was um, about getting input from, from among, the, the question was about low language uh, end users. How do we, you know, people that have, that, that, yeah, that, that have, that, that have got um, limited language skills. Victoria, actually, you have really interesting examples again from Norfolk. Hi, absolutely. I, I think when we, we, we very specifically talked then about low language, but then I think Rob um, has touched on it that we treat everybody that comes into our service as an individual and that's the joy of the program and we we seek to um, work to their strengths and to identify those gaps so if there is issues with perhaps language or accessibility that is something that we we work on every single day is what the appro most appropriate method of um, conversation and consultation and and ongoing discussions with with our carers are is by understanding that everybody, we talk about them again, like you've just said, Tim, we talk about carers or beneficiaries as one homogenous group. That's absolutely not the way we work in Norfolk. And we very much work towards the fact that everybody is an individual. And we have the flexibility in the, the way our, our service is, is designed and ever changing to, if we find a new way to engage with a particular group or we find an area of good practice, we, we can set that rolling straight away without having to go through the, the hoops perhaps on a, a very service, um, a service development, very strict service specification in mind. Thanks, Victoria. I, I, I think it's an interesting question, I think from Quinton, the user voice form of engagement and co-creation while vital seems distinct from community representative deliberative democracy engagement. Um, are you, uh, are, uh, is anyone familiar with examples of utilising both community voice and user voice in shaping outcomes and measures, um, which could would utilise for our dashboard indicators in the design of an intervention? So I think that distinction between the end user, inverted commas, and broader community um, engagement is, an, um, is one that's come up a little bit and the notion of how it does drive more deliberative um, participatory democracy, um, which you know sometimes I would imagine is a little bit outside the the sort of remit of of a SIB, um, but you know does it end up that you know does it have that broader reform um, um, option or um, um, going forward? I wonder if anyone's got any comments on that. How this sort of process can you know, promote broader reforms around um, democracy. Tim, if, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just say a couple of words. One, the way that I think of this um, as it relates even potentially to civs is that we, we need, you know, stakeholders involved that not only are people who are end users of a particular service, but also those who hold the levers of economic and political power. So this point about, um, deliberative democracy and engagement in those ways is really a point about power. So where does power sit? And so mm -hmm. in order to engage that power stream, there is a parallel process perhaps to how we are engaging users in service delivery and design and, and evaluation. Um, but I think that is a critical piece actually to get, achieve social change, but it often does operate in a, in a different place. And so for my mind is thinking about political power, it's thinking about where expertise sits that will really help as we develop programs that, that lead to authentically better outcomes for, for everyone. Would, Thanks, would, Gareth. would it be possible to add to that, Tim? Sure, yeah, yeah, go Rob, yeah. Um, in Northeast Lincolnshire, when we stopped you know, commissioning providers and started giving budgets to individuals. One of the things that we, we did in the conversations was what interest groups that, that, that across everyone, what, what, what interests you? And one of the things that came up was a women's group. Um, and since then, the women's group has grown massively. They commission through their budgets a whole range of different services. Um, in fact, they're going to launch as a social enterprise. They're going to be, you know, longer standing than the 
uh, you know, what we're delivering in our current contract. And, and, you know, that's their democracy. They can buy what they want. They can commission what they want. They can design what they want. They're a force. And what they've done is they've taken their individual budgets, put them together, and they have discussions about where they want to go, what they want to do, and how they want to do that. And that's replicated to a larger or lesser extent in all of the different groups. So with that common interest, what do we want to buy? What do we have together? One thing I think is, is common um, that we've talked about here, especially when you look at Northeast Lincolnshire, the cavalry is not coming. There is no point waiting for the promises that have been come from central to different areas to happen. It is not coming. And when you realise that, you have to then think about what are the skills we've got around in, in this population? And they are amazing skills. And if we can facilitate that, we can create our own cavalry, I suppose, for a terrible analogy. But anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, just moving on, maybe shifting gear a little bit. And I think um, an issue I think we, we touched on with Victoria, and I think Tom has raised it in the, tra- uh, in the chat about does ha- anyone have experience of, pre- of presenting evaluation data to groups of users and gaining new understanding as to what the data is telling us? Other examples of good practice or mistakes to avoid. I think I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know, Victoria. Do you want to kick off Absolutely. on that? I think this is the first thing, and I did notice that that in the chat, and I thought that's a question that I'd really like to answer. Is what to avoid? We've never made assumptions. We ask our carers how they would like that data presented. We they hold us to account, and boy, do they! Um, but we make no assumptions about their capabilities. We very much go to them. We have um, different formats in which we send the data out. Some people love an Excel spreadsheet. Some people can't think of anything worse. So we tailor our information that we, we share out to the audience that will be receiving it. And that's been very, very well received. We send it out in advance ahead of time to give people a chance to digest it. It's no good turning up at meeting with, with reams and reams of data um, what we also do is we offer our insights, but very much with our program in Norfolk, and I think this relates, this is kind of a common theme through, and I think, again, Rob probably mentioned this earlier, is the trust in um, our service users to, and leaving, leaving the egos at the door as organisations, we believe very strongly that to achieve our outcomes, there's only one set of um, uh, professionals that, that, that we really need to improve their lives. Um, and by presenting them the data and asking them, what their views are and offering our insights, we're always happy to be proven wrong. And I think that perhaps is an issue for, um, historically an issue for organisations where they they don't want to be proven wrong. They don't want to have their uh, pre preconceived ideas um, pre- proven not to be perhaps right. Personally, from, from the um, view of our programme is I love, I absolutely love being proven wrong um by the beneficiaries because what it means is we've got a better service and it's improving the lives for but for all the carers that we're working with um trust trust your beneficiaries trust that they understand things we are the professional we can put the data together but um it's really interesting to listen to the views of um the people and the, some of the greatest insights you'll get are from people who would, you would never expect to understand or be able to decipher data so yeah the, the trust thing is a really really um, big part of that and to not make make assumptions about your beneficiaries understanding of of data great thanks victoria i'm very conscious of our time we've only really got a few minutes left before the um we have to wrap up um uh, but i think in the chat um there's some fantastic both questions and i think you know some input i noticed gary you added um it's the 50th anniversary or in 2019 of Sherry Arnstein's ladder of participation and um, and raising some of that, which is great to go back to some of that historical um, um, uh, th- theory and practice on participation. But um, yeah, a range of other things and some other great questions. So I think what the, all those questions and ideas are being captured by um, in the chat and that'll be um, provided to people. I think we're um, we're just about to, um, what I might do now is to quickly ask each panellist just quickly for a, 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 a one or half, a 30-second, one-minute sort of final comment. Um, 
So we might just go back around the order um, and maybe ask Hillary and um, and Mika and Mil, um, Miller and Gary if there's any just quick comments to, to conclude. Start with um, start with Hillary. Hi, thank you. Yes, um, one final comment, which sort of builds on some of the other discussion that's been happening, is that I think the highly collaborative nature of SIBs um, has also been hugely important for sort of the longevity of these co-created strength-based practices more in the long term. Um, and we've seen some really great examples in the case studies of the SIB partners advocating for the use of these practices within the wider system, challenging the more traditionally deficit-based systems, um, and really putting structures in place to make sure that these practices continue once the SIB contracts end. So I think that's a really important piece um, just to, to keep in mind for other SIBs. Um, but I think that's, that's really showing a lot of promise for how these can actually contribute to maybe longer term changes as well, not just the SIB itself. Thanks, Hillary. Um, Mila? Um, yeah, no, thank you, Hillary, for that. That, that. that is spot on. And I think, well, thank you, everybody, because uh, again, I've learned a ton, which is brilliant. Um, but I think, well, I think that's the, as we like to say, um, kind of our mantra is changing the system, not the person. But I think with that, one of the things that is really important is um, uh, many of the points that you brought up, which is how do we really go about changing the system? And I think we talked about many um, brilliant practices in terms of what we can do as practitioners and how we can make a real change in people's lives. And then how do we take that forward in terms of changing the infrastructure and change, continuing to um, build that um, collaborative way of delivery, as Hilary said, and making sure that that is indeed sustainable. And I think there is um, a lot more that we need to do there. And I guess on our end, thus far, we seem to be making progress in doing that with local authorities and local commissioners, where it does feel like that relationship is much closer and it does feel like the um, understanding of the local context and issues is very clear but i do think we're still um we still need to make a lot of progress with central government and any reflections on that would be very well right thank you <laughs> thanks Mila. Uh, uh, gary do you want to make any any quick final comments um other than the fact that i chose the sun rising background and the sun is literally on my forehead right now um <laughs> I, I think what i would like to <laughs> Just to note is that it sounds and sometimes that, you know, this flexibility and where we get user voice in these processes is unstructured, but in fact, it's the opposite. It's intentionally structured with these different ways to engage people. And, and I think that um, this is an exciting time to build out those structures, to test those structures. Um, and I think it'll inform not just the issues that we're talking about here around outcomes-based contracting, but also issues around deliberative democracy and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about the people working on these issues, um, all yeah. being on this conversation today. Great. Thanks, Gary. Victoria? Uh, yeah, I think my, my final reflection is um, service user involvement is it can be a difficult process. There is absolutely no one size fits all. But my advice to anyone there who's starting out with, with this is to listen to every single conversation, no matter how quiet, because that's where you will, you will find the gems that really do improve outcomes for people. Great. Thanks, Victoria. To Pia? Thank you very much. I think for me, um, I'd just like to appreciate everybody's input and hearing how everybody else's work has been going and some of the things that have they have learned has been an, uh, a highlight for me. Um, just briefly, uh, thank you very much as well. Um, I think just to end there, that's all for me. Great, thank you. Thanks, it's fantastic to have you here today. Uh, Jen and Steve. Oh, well, I'd say that this has been a fascinating conversation and I think everyone even outside of, of these rooms where we care a lot and want to learn more about this agrees superficially that user engagement is important. I think where the rubber really meets the road is when things are taking a long time, when, when resources are scarce, when uh, stakeholders are having trouble aligning on other pieces. 
um, and user engagement falls by the wayside. And I think the evidence um, is such a huge piece of, of combating that. And um, I think the story, the stories of, of specific uh, pieces of work that you all have shared today um, goes a long way to, to showing the specifics of why something is useful. And, and I hope that data is integrated in that as well, which I think we touched on a bit. Um, but I, I think that we can, we, we as a community can really make that strong arguments and show the value of user engagement. That's great. Thanks, Jen. And Steve? There are so many good things have been said. Hard to find something different. Uh, but I'll go with user voices are really key in engaging kind of key decision makers. You may be looking at things in a very logical and a rational way, but actually once you have somebody in the room who can tell you their story about the impact on them, their loved ones, that just engages a whole emotional side of a decision maker that you don't normally get hold of. And that can be really important in making those decisions about commissioning or policy making. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, and, and just a final comment from me, I think, um, what, what struck me is um, the um, the appetite people have in the in, in the presentations, and I think in the discussion about using SIBs and user voice in in the context of both delivering for the the project or the initiative, but also how it, how it has potential to engage broader um, broader reform and broader um, um, engagement in. Um, policy making. So I think that's been really interesting that that's both both keeping a, a focus on what the what the outcome is to be delivered, but also the potential for that to, to deliver broader outcomes for society and for um, for community. So that's been been terrific. I think we've just got the final um, slides being put up, um, which sort of talks about the post. Um, um, thank you for participating and. I think we're just to, to flag, we've got um, the conference session, um, politicians in the, in the boardroom, how governments uh, should handle responsible business um, and the speakers there, um, um, uh, there for, um, at, I think it's six to seven your time. Well, well into my, hopefully my bedtime in Australia. Um, and I think that's that's been great. And then um, I think there's also we're going to um, seek get feedback from people um, um, based on the chat. Um, and I think it's been a great session. And I think what what happens now? Ask people if they want to uh, to leave the Zoom call, and we're going to have a 15 minute sort of tea break, either virtually or in the room, where people can um, um, can catch up with each other. Um, either, as I say, virtually or in the room. So I think that's probably right on um, right on the end of the session. So thanks, everyone. Um, it's been great meeting you all. And um, I hope we can stay engaged in this important endeavour. So all the best, everyone.